Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Random Redshirt Podcast. I am one of the hosts, Zach, and the other host is Chris. What's up, Chris? Hey, Zach. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us all over the world. Great to be here, as always, my friend. And today we get to talk about some really, really cool stuff in the season finale of season two of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. It's going to be an awesome time. Yeah, it really is. This is uh, this was an epic episode, in my opinion. <laughs> um, really looking forward to talking about this one. So much to break down, so much to get to. We're going to get to all of it right here uh, on the Random Richard podcast. Uh, so, yes, welcome to our podcast. We are a couple of nerdy guys who like to talk about all things nerdy, Star Trek, Star Wars, and everything in between. Uh, please be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram if you haven't already, and follow us there for all the latest episode updates and announcements. Also, you can find us on YouTube, and be sure to subscribe to us there and hit the bell for notifications as well as your favorite podcast platform. You can find us all over the interwebs, Chris. That's right. The interwebs, outstanding. And America right, Online. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we're on AOL. We, we don't have a MySpace page either. So we're kind of <laughs> we're kind of behind the times on that one. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So episode number 10, this is the season finale of Star Trek's Strange New World season two. It 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 came, it went by quick, Chris. Like I, I feel like we just started season two, and now we're already talking about the finale. And I kind of feel like we—that's kind of how we felt with Picard season three a little bit. Yeah, so quick. I think it started like in early June, right? The this season yeah. two of Strange New Worlds, so quick. It felt really, really quick to me because I felt there were definitely a few like one-off episodes that I kind of put to the side for me, just like we were talking about the, uh, um the rap subspace rhapsody and uh, those old scientists those i kind of felt like oh they're they're cool but i put them to the side making yeah. me feel like the actual seasonal episodes were short but yeah yeah that's true yeah i would say so i mean um it, it I, I i will say with the the kind of episodes you mentioned where they're like mm -hmm. you know one-offs you put them to the side they still in certain respects continued mm -hmm. certain storylines and character arcs and character development which i thought was good yeah, for sure. It's kind of a it's kind of a best of both worlds, no pun intended. <laughs> um, that because you're get you're getting the serialization, yeah. But you're also getting the the continual arcs, which I think is great. Um, yeah. But this episode, episode number ten, hegemony, is very very jam packed. There's a lot going on here. This one was definitely a whopper. Um, and it was it was a lot it was a lot of fun it was adventurous it had a little bit of that horror crossover feel to it again um like we saw in episode number nine of season one i believe the one where hammer hammer dies uh spoilers yeah um and where the gorn show up and then their babies because episode number nine i believe is the first time we get uh significant insight into how the gorn are born and and you know what that does to the host and everything we didn't know any of that stuff before then yeah. i know the gorn are mentioned before episode nine but we don't get that detail until episode nine now of course now that we know that we know that the effect that has and of course that's going to have a big role later in this episode it's very interesting chris when you mentioned on our previous review of the last episode you, you had some kind of i think your spidey senses were tingling yeah i i think i felt like uh oh i think captain Vitell is going to be in peril which yes that, that we'll talk about that but i think we were we were correct we were feeling uh oh there's there's some trouble there's going to be some peril there's going to be some very very dire circumstances that they're working through and indeed that that is that is what we got i felt that I was really pleased with the quality of this episode. It it felt really cinematic to me. It yeah. really felt like like a movie. Indeed, like each of the ones that they've had the Gorn on, even from season one, because there were some like like incredible ones with the Gorn. Remember, like they went, uh, they did the ship maneuver. I think and either went like close to, I want to say close to a black hole or or close to a star. I'm I'm sorry, my mind is. It was a black hole, yeah, black hole. Um, but they're just they're able to put together these really cin cinematic terrific kind of set pieces and, and scenes and draw us in and it felt like it felt theatrical where i wanted to see this like in, in a theater um yeah like mini movies yeah mini movies yeah yeah, yeah. 
I agree. Yeah, if you're watching us on YouTube, obviously you can see we kind of made ourselves prepared for the Gorn episode. Mm -hmm. I brought my signed Bobby Clark Gorn Funko Pop, the Target exclusive, and Chris has got his signed Bobby Clark Gorn fighting scene with uh, him and Kirk. Outstanding, yeah. From Arena. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, because that was a couple of years ago, your first Star Trek yeah. convention, and we got a chance to meet him. Uh, he, he's usually at a lot of conventions, but it's really cool to get that. And, of course, we we felt like we had to come prepared, right? We had to bring some Gorn to this, this Random Richard podcast episode. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's jump into this. So... This is the first episode in a while where we have not opened with a personal log. We got right? a captain's log. We got a captain's log, but not a personal log. <laughs> right. In the sense of what we're normally getting, right? And and we open with this idea of the Cayuga. Well, not really an idea. It's a scene where the USS Cayuga's crew has, uh, you know, landed on planet Parnassus Beta, which is a very toss sounding planet name, right? Like they had some really interesting mm -hmm. names back then for how they named planets. Yeah. Uh, and they're helping this, this colony of, of humans uh, with logistical needs, medical needs, things like that. They're helping give inoculations. And I think even nurse chapel says at one point that everybody's, everybody has uh, been inoculated and they're all caught up on their, on their, uh, their vaccines and so forth. Yeah. And so Prior to her going to this internship that she has been selected for, uh, she clearly is, I guess she's left the ship and she's maybe getting a ride with the Cayuga to the internship, it would seem. Yeah, that's what it sounded like because Nurse Chapel says, you know, thanks for the ride. Um, and, you know, Captain Vitell like, no, no problem. Um, so that's that's what I felt, too. Yeah, it's like part of the and she was I think she was happy to get away a little bit, too. Um, you know, all of the probably drama that was happening between her and Spock on the enterprise, just good for her to get away and clear her mind and get ready for the internship. So that was, that was good for, for nurse chapel, but we get, um, you know, nurse chapel's able to beam aboard the Cayuga, but then, you know, we get some, uh, a few little scenes here where captain Battelle is realizing, you know, she's talking to one of her ensigns, um, to communicate to Cayuga and they're realizing they're having some communication problems with the Cayuga. Yeah. Because it yeah. starts with her talking with Pike, right? Yeah. I think, I think yes. she calls Pike. I want to say, or Pike call, maybe Pike calls her, mm -hmm. I thought she called Pike. Anyways, they, they call each other. Right. And I love, I love the line that, um, that uh, uh, Pike says where Bat Battelle's like, Hey, how you holding up? And you know, Pike's like, I mean, I'm not bursting into song every 10 minutes. So that's, victory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I thought that was a nice little, little throwback to the previous episode. Um, and I thought that that there was, that was a really funny, uh, you know, thing to throw in there. Yep. Yep. For sure. And I, and it was cute, like near the end of the conversation, I think he says something like, yeah, I, I miss you. And she kind of, she smiles and just says, you know, hey, was that so hard to say? So, yeah, uh, I thought that was, that was Doesn't he say something too? Like, yeah, that wasn't, it really wasn't that hard or something like that. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So that was good. That was good. Yeah. There's some, there's some good quotes there. So yeah, there, there's some communication issues and she, and then she loses the signal. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're not talking to her. Uh, they do mention, okay, so I have to kind of go back maybe and correct myself here because they do mention about subspace, opening a subspace channel. So I I think I had previously mentioned that I, I didn't think that they were using subspace oh. communication much during this era, but maybe they were. I just, I, I don't remember. I'll, I'll be honest with you. And you know what? I, I There's no Trekkie out there that remembers everything. All right. <laughs> so, um, but that being said, yeah, I, I they, they were communicating via subspace um, frequency. Uh, which makes right. sense, I guess, you know, lo lo longer distances apart, you have to communicate via subspace or it's going to take too long to get there. Yeah. Um, so she loses comms and then uh, they look up and notice a shuttlecraft is falling. And then up in the sky, this large Gorn ship descends onto her position, which of course, at the moment, at that particular moment, you know, if we knew nothing about what was coming, we wouldn't exactly know it was a Gorn ship. Right. It's just this large vessel in the sky coming out. It's very interesting. I, I I thought too, Chris, this planet, right? So they have they mentioned that they have modeled this colony after mid-20th century Earth. 
Yeah. Very common in toss to model yes. human colonies after other eras of 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 uh human history. I mean, we had we had one where I don't remember the name of the planet where they find that book about like Chicago mob mobsters or whatever in like the mm -hmm. 1930s or 40s and they model their whole society around the mob. Yeah. Um this is this is a thing that's happened before. Yeah. Yeah, and having that kind of image of that western front street that I thought was so cool. It made it definitely made me think of Toss. It de definitely made me think of the episode with uh, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Uh, I think as the as the Earp family, and you know, with yeah. the the OK Corral. Definitely yeah, made me think about, about that, that episode. One. Was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Um, you know that the Gorn ship coming down. You're right. We would not have known it's the Gorn ship. If you yeah, if you had not seen the trailer, if you had not known, you know what was going to happen next, you wouldn't know right away. Yeah, you wouldn't know right away. It was so menacing looking, like because it looked like it was descending through the clouds or the fog, and you you kind of saw this those wisps of of either a cloud or contrails coming off the ship, and I thought that looked great. Uh, Did it remind you of the scene from Independence Day where the ships, the, all the oh, aliens yes. are landing up, coming through the clouds and Earth and they hover over the big cities? It reminded me of that scene from Independence Day. Oh, perfect. Yeah, now that you mention it, or it, scenes, it did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you know what I was thinking at that moment? I was like, to our knowledge, I don't know if if those are, if those ships can cloak. Uh, but I was like, didn't someone like, didn't couldn't the Cayuga have seen that like coming from at least some distance away but we never know we never we don't know yet yeah we don't know yet and then uh things get worse from here right a lot worse yeah. um and this all happens very quickly from the time the comms are broken to the time that uh we jump uh and so P pike loses communication and then on the bridge i believe there's some information coming out about what's ha kind of what's happened. They, I think they they lose, they lose a signal or something that they're, that they're not showing the Cayuga there anymore or whatever. And um, Pike, you could tell very quickly, Pike is worried, right? He's like, okay, something something's up. And that that thing that was landing on the ship, or on the ship that was that was coming mm -hmm. onto the planet. We learn later what that is. It actually wasn't like a Gorn ship ship per se i believe it was the device that was landing to you know sever communication to the surface and not allow transports and stuff but we'll get into yeah. that in a little bit um but yeah you could tell very quickly captain pike's significant concern i mean you know you think about it's not just another federation ship right he is biased in this case because he mm -hmm. has you know feelings and he has a relationship with captain patel there's an interesting scene between him and admiral april right where uh, Admiral April says something to the effect of, you know, it's it's very evident that we don't know, we don't understand the Gorn. Yeah. Right? And he's like, well, Pike's, Pike's like, well, we've seen them up close and personal, and they're really not un hard to understand, Bob. They're monsters. And uh, Admiral April's like, well, monster is a word to describe those who don't understand us. And Pike's, I love, I love this line that Pike says in here. He says, and sometimes a monster is just a monster, right? Yeah. You don't have to try to, to de-villainize it or make it, make it what it isn't. Sometimes a monster is just a monster. Yeah. So I really, really, really like that, that line and that exchange between um, April and, and Pike was interesting because April says something to the effect of you know if if you go are you is your is your judgment going to be clouded because of your relationship with captain Battelle? he knows right i mean him and Battelle were together on that planet the very first episode when admiral april lands on the planet to recruit him back to starfleet early yeah that's right so um it's a very it's very interesting uh kind of what happens there um and then uh the enterprise i believe gets a message that Starfleet relays them because the Gorn sent this message to Starfleet and Starfleet relays this to them, I believe is how the order went. And it's a map. Oh yeah. An image. Yeah. 
And, and you see the system, right? You see the system uh, with Parnassus Beta and a red line. And yeah. on the other side of the red line is the debris of the Cayuga, which obviously they, you know, uh, Pike makes some order to say, you know, how fast can you get us there? Get us there as fast as you can or whatever. They warp to where where they are. And as soon as they arrive, they see the debris field of the Cayuga. They do. And, and you know and what I, I think this is? I think this is when they get the message, right? Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. You know what I, I, I liked when they, when they get there? This is either at those scenes or a few scenes after. And they're seeing that debris field and Pike. I mean, they're all stunned, right? And and Pike says something like, um, "Okay, you know, hold it together, people, or or we're not going to make an assumption assumptions right now." And some, I think Una says, "Everyone, remember your training." She says some line line like 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 that because everyone's kind of on they're really on the edge, and she's like, "Everyone, remember your training." You know, we yeah, can... because I think that that helps them focus to to know what to look for, right? Because mm -hmm. the the pro protocol yeah. states that in a situation like this. This is what you would expect Federation, you know, members of Starfleet to do, right? They would send signals, they would, you know, uh, distress calls, all sorts of stuff. So mo monitoring and being able to see through the debris field as much as they can, hopefully, to help help find survivors. Yeah, yeah. So that that was that was good. Um, y you know, they this kind of sets into motion their emergency conference that they've got um pike then realizes you know he he's never talked to this, talked about this before but they're saying how are we going to fight the gorn and he, and he says oh well we've got something and let's let's beam it to uh the ready room and there's all these new weapons that they're able to to bring out and take a look at and and tricorders too i believe right and, things yeah. that can detect the gorn now because before they couldn't detect him right now they can with the updated tech yeah super secret anti-gorn weaponry so including yeah, good, good old grenades. section yeah. 31s at work again isn't it <laughs> probably were yeah you know i i i like when when um so they they also have those nitrogen grenades yeah which are really significant right because uhura pulls one out and she's like nitrogen grenades and spock says rent it renders anything in a 10 meter range frozen lawn says deadly for a cold-blooded lizard and dr big is like deadly for anyone yeah yeah, so that I liked that a lot, and yeah, and they get to use those toys too. I didn't, we, I don't think we saw them use the nitric nitrogen grenades on this episode, but it's cool they've got those, and it's it's Erica Ortega that says, "Hey, we've got all these new weapons and they're cool toys and everything, but how are we even going to get there?" Essentially, yeah. Right? So um, that's true. Yeah, I love I love the idea they come up with where um, Uhura says something uh, something about a zombie movie like zombie movie trick. And Spock's like zombie movie, and Una's like, yeah, dress up like you're dead, so the zombies don't notice you. You've never seen one. And Spock's like zombie, a zombie, no, a movie, yes. But I will add some to my research. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a funny, great little exchange there. Yeah, that was good. Look like you're dead. Yeah. Yep. And that's what they do. If you look, mm -hmm. if you if you if you go back and rewatch the scene where the shuttlecraft is entering the atmosphere and flying through. They like put a bunch of junk all over the outside of the shuttle to make it look like debris. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now I connected the dots. So was... they made the shuttle look like, you know, zombie like, right? Yeah. They made it look like space junk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I... When I saw the, when I saw the shuttle, it, it looked peculiar to me and I just didn't connect the dots at that point. I thought, oh, like what happened to the shuttle? But yeah, now it totally makes sense. Yeah. So I'm glad that you point, pointed that out. And it was a, I thought it was a terrific scene with that shuttle um, and it um, descending into the planet. I love that they use um, the terminology that Ortega uh, uses, Lagrange, right? She goes, what? She says something like oh, hey, Lagrange. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lagrange. Yeah. So, so yeah. basically, uh, and they're real things, right? Yeah. So the James Webb telescope is parked at a Lagrange point or Lagrange yeah. point. I think it's, I think it's people's pronounce lagrange basically lagrange point my understanding is a an area of space where gravitation gravitational effects are somewhat neutral mm -hmm. so it can park itself somewhere and not have to have on board a ton of fuel to use thrusters and propulsion and stuff to keep it you know 
to do maneuvers and, and station keeping to keep it in place because there's not a specific gravitational force from a certain direction that Lagrange point, it can hang out and not have to deal with that. So that's what I believe that's the, the uh, my understanding of it anyways. That's and that's, that's where that's, that's where they shot for a, a, a Lagrange point within the solar system to park the uh, James Webb space telescope. And uh, um, it's like, a, it's about a million miles away from earth um in uh you know away from a ton of light so it can really peer deep into the into the universe and i don't know if people have seen it i know it's a little bit of a rabbit hole i apologize no this is cool but the yeah. james webb tell the images we're getting from the james webb telescope are just unbelievable mm -hmm. absolutely unbelievable um i mean my goodness like you know from my from my world viewpoint my goodness what a beautiful creation let me just say that right there so it's absolutely gorgeous and the, the images are incredible so and I am familiar with Lagrange from differential equations on Lagrange transforms. There you go. Oh, yeah, that went <laughs> down a rabbit hole too. But <laughs> man, we're getting super nerdy, aren't we? Here, you know. But that's all right. That's cool. Hey, we we did say at the beginning we're just two nerdy guys. So. Indeed. <laughs> you know. Um. So this this scene with the shuttlecraft uh, was really cool. You know, they're essentially a free fall, right? Once they hit gravity, it's just a free fall, hot descent. Um, yeah, to, they, to the even point. even Peleus says they have to do some calculations and for trajectory and things like that in order yeah. to make all the angles and the math uh, uh, work in order to allow once they get to that certain point, like you said, allow gravity to kind of take over and, 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 and you know, bring the shuttle in. Yeah. Um, and Ortega was just terrific on it. So you should see that her concentration and her smile and you see Pike's expression and he's, he looks like he's he looks like he's going to be sick. You know, essentially, and um, he's kind of saying, "Oh, when when are you going to start the engines?" And he kind of chuckles and says, are "You trying to back seat like fly me, Captain?" <laughs> Did this, then, yeah, yeah, yeah. She says, "Doesn't she say like, weren't you a test pilot or before yeah. or whatever?" And I love, I love this line by Pike where he says, uh, "Ortegas, you were born for this." Yeah. And then she has this really big grin in her face. I thought that was absolutely perfect. That's, I mean, talk about like a funny line, but also an ins an inspiring thing to say to somebody at a moment like that. Yeah, that right? giving giving that confidence, you know. It it gave her. You remember when we were talking about like where Ortega uh, in the episode those old scientists when they came back and Boy Boimer, I'm sorry if I got his name wrong. But he says, "Hey, you know, you're a war hero," and that it was a, it was a line there. So we were thinking, "Yeah, what did what did Ortega do in, in the war?" And in this episode, you know, she says, "Yeah, I've done this like a hundred times that that maneuver." It just gives you like some so much during the war too. Yeah, during the war. Yeah, yeah. Just there's so much background to Ortega that that's yeah. cool. And we'll get into some of this about. You know, at the end of this, we'll wrap up with our overall thoughts, maybe talk about some of our, you know, expectations or things we'd like to see in season three. So I'll save my thoughts there. But yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the Gorn deposit this big device on the on the yeah. planet surface. And it's for all intents and purposes, a dampening field. Mm -hmm. Right. The yeah. inability to communicate on the ground. The inability to transport people up from the surface, it 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 makes it to where you physically have to come get people. Um, which obviously, when the Gorn say, "Hey, this is the line, this is our territory, don't cross this line," and, the, and honestly, Starfleet tells them, "Hey, don't cross that line. Stay on your side of the line." They don't want to start a war with the Gorn. I think they realize how powerful the Gorn are. They don't want to get into a battle. I mean. It's very evident from what happened to the Cayuga, the Gorn have more than enough firepower and capability to take down a Constitution class starship very easily. And back then, the Constitution class starship was, you know, kind of the the premier premier ship in the in the fleet. Um, so that yeah. that's significant, right? Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you know, even though Admiral April made his statement. Pike does have a bias. He has feelings for Battelle. He wants to, he even says in the bridge, right? Like, you know, something about going and getting Battelle. Oh yeah. And her crew, right? Like he didn't want it to just sound like to his crew that, that uh, it was all about her. Yeah. Yeah. I got, it. yep, totally. But 
you know, that makes sense. Like Ad, Admiral April, Admiral ha April's back. You know, he's he's not seeing everything that Captain Pike is seeing. He's making he, Admiral April's making decisions based on the information that he has. Yeah. But they're very, very like objective decisions, right? Completely objective. Yeah. He's objective. I, yeah. yeah, I do like Admiral April, by the way. Yeah. I, I, I think that he I think he's a, a fairly no nonsense leader. Um in certain respects, not everything obviously, but in certain respects, he reminds me a little bit of Bachev. Not on the same not like not like in the, the bossy mm -hmm. kind of, you know, maybe brash way that Nacheyev was, but when you look back at Admiral Nacheyev, right? And when we talked with Natalia, we talked about this as well, that she was right. Her approach and her messaging may not have been good, but she was right. She was sensible. Um, and I think Admiral April is kind of the same way in that regard. Yeah, I agree. So I, I like I like his character. I'd like to see more of him as the show continues. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's nice to see that contrast um, yeah. in decision making for sure, and then the different perspectives. Yeah, and yeah. and and April April and Pike have a history, right? They've had mm -hmm. a history of service, so um, I think there's a there's a, a continued relationship uh, for, from a supervisor and supervisee role, uh, and maybe potential friendship role that could be could be explored further down the road. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, when when they are ground side, when they're planet side, I thought that was really cool. Um, it gave me a sense of action. They are um, reminding me a lot of aliens. I don't know if you felt the same way, but reminding me a lot of aliens with the squad kind of yep. moving out, right? Hundred percent. Right um, and we, you know, we've got Sam Kirk, which is awesome, and we've got uh, Leon. And you know, of course, uh, Pike there too. But this they just can't ever get enough of Lon. So I know. Oh, and she's she was awesome in this this episode. Sam was too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We, we got a lot of red shirts in this episode, did we not? We did. We got a lot of red shirts, which is, of course, it's always a good thing. Well, for us as watching, maybe not necessarily always the people on screen, but we got introduced to a new red shirt too. We did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's gonna be big. One. Yeah. So they so as the strike team's moving out, they take out one of the younglings, apparently, Gorn's right yep. there with their new phaser. Yeah. Some kind of yeah, new 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 phaser rifle, and it was pretty quick. It was like one shot and it's down. Yeah. And I was I was kind of like, dang, they took out a baby Gorn, but yeah, I guess they have to. So Yeah, they can't really discriminate between <laughs> baby and older Gorn. I mean, honestly, up to this point, right, in the episode and through the show, we have not seen an adult Gorn yet. Mm -hmm. We've only seen juveniles, right? We saw in, in the ship in episode nine of season one, we saw just these young ones, right? Because what happened? They they hatched out of that alien guy. They ran around the ship and they 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 metabolized so quickly, right? They grow so fast yeah. that they went from really little popping out of this alien dude's chest to being the size we just see like this one on this planet pretty quickly yeah so but we have not seen an adult yet because the ones that they had, they fought on that ship were pretty young obviously yeah yeah for sure for sure so they get to take out the baby gorn uh then their motion trackers which their motion trackers were cool i don't know if you took the if you paid attention to the audio cues Oh yeah, you had you totally told me about the audio cues in this, and there's a whole bunch of toss. Uh, I felt audio cues in this episode, yeah. episode too, plus um that tracker sound. I really reminded me of both Aliens and Star Trek Two: Wrath of Khan when they mm -hmm. had that tracker going. But yeah, but they had a whole bunch of more Gorn coming, so they have to go into hiding and to avoid those those Gorn uh, finding them. But they also pick up a human signal, yeah. While they're hiding, can we can we really quickly? We have to mention, yeah, the irony of the fact that Pike picks out a particular building or room to go into when they hide. Initially, he, he picks a barber shop, which is funny. Because of the running gag about Pike's hair getting taller and taller and taller up front, he picks a barbershop. So I don't know if that was in, that had to be intentionally done by the writers. 
but the the <laughs> build, the, build the, the, the 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 storefront they go into the store they go to is a barber shop. I just thought that was hilarious. And doesn't he say, "Let's go into the barber shop"? Yes, he say yeah. barber shop. Yeah. yeah, I think it's I think it's hilarious that that, that had to be intentional. It had to be. They've got to know about this running gag with the hair thing, right? So with Pike's hair. So I'm sure that was intentionally done. And it was it, it, it was very clever, little, subtle, funny, funny joke. Okay, that was cool. Yeah, that was good. That was good. Yeah. I like that. So after they get the human signal, you know, picking up the human signal, they go and look for that. And uh, you know, they find a device that's essentially a decoy device sending out human signals. And they get trapped, and they realize the then the individual that comes out that traps them. He kind of comes out and introduces himself as the only, the one and only Lieutenant Montgomery Scott. So we, yeah, Lieutenant Junior Grade Montgomery Scott. Yes, that was a fantastic scene. I thought. Yeah, as soon as I heard the voice, I'm like, "That's Scotty, isn't it?" Yeah, and and it was. Uh, played by Martin Quinn, the actor. Mm. Um, I thought, I thought he was really good. I liked it. I liked, I liked this young rendition of Scotty. Really, really good. Um, and I, 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 I'm not against them bringing Scotty into this. I mean, I'm trying to think. Was, was Scotty a part of the cage with, with Captain Pike, Jeffrey Hunter's Captain Pike? I don't remember if he was on the ship or not. I don't think so. I, I don't think he was either. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing to say that Scotty couldn't have been on the ship before Kirk took over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to Scotty coming in. I'll be curious to see if he sticks moving forward, right, into season three, or if he co becomes part of the ship, because that means we'll only have, we will have gotten one barely a season of Hammer as a chief engineer. And then that means we'd be getting barely a season of Pelia as a chief engineer. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is the Enterprise going through chief engineers like crap through a goose? I mean, what are we doing here? Oh, yeah. Hopefully not. I, I, that, I, yeah. I am I am actually starting to like Pelia. Um, I, I never disliked her, but I I, I think I'm I've I've floated to the side of of liking her character. I think she's the character settling in. Mm -hmm. um yeah. she's not just some goofball she has really funny lines but also can have serious moments i think i i i've, I've enjoyed her character as we've yeah. gone along through the season yeah well i mean she's got a very different personality than everybody right so, so having her kind of contribute to the scenes is makes the scenes you know very interesting no for sure and it and it fits too right it fits because of the type of alien species she is right she's been around for thousands of years so imagine living all this time and seeing all this civilization it's probably going to make you a little quirky too <laughs> very quirky yeah yeah. Indeed. yeah now did you notice the name of the ship that scotty came from chris i thought that was a very interesting name yeah i did really like the name the uss star diver now is there I mean, besides us, like really liking the name is cool. And I don't recall that name ever being used before in, in Star Trek. Yeah, I think it's new. New. Okay. But I, I wonder if there's any other significance to that name. But cool name, though. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know of any significance. Maybe it just was just chosen because it was cool. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Very interesting, too, because Scotty was working, he said, uh, in a nearby system when he was attacked by the Gorn. Only survivor of the ship, unfortunately. So that means the star mm -hmm. diver didn't – we will never see it unless yeah. it's like fan art. And uh, it, it it met an untimely death. Um, and apparently he was working – I want to say it was some, on some kind of sail ship or something, right? He was working on this project in that system? Yeah, studying, studying some sort of uh, – solar phenomenon that's that's yeah. what i i took from yeah. it so pretty cool yep. yeah yeah and then he just he was able to make his way to parnassus um in it on a shuttle on a shuttle right so he was able to get away and survive and we find we find out later that he did some did his usual miracle worker stuff to to get get away from the gorn is he the okay is he the star trek version of macgyver 
Ooh, I, that's interesting. I got my guyver. I got my guyver <laughs> yeah. right up here. Yeah, my guyver up there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can, you can kind of see him. Maybe he's right there. <laughs> um, I would say, I would say possible. I mean, if you think about it, all the chief engineers in Star Trek on the shows all kind of have some of that MacGyverism in them, right? They kind of yeah. have to. Um, I think that's kind of it's almost like part of the requirements for the application. Uh, can you take a toothpick and a <laughs> and a paperclip and make a bomb out of it? <laughs> oh, you can. Great, you're hired. Yeah. Um, I think it, it's almost kind of a a, a requirement uh, to be a chief engineer. It seems like. I mean, I I mean, yes. I would consider Jordy kind of a miracle worker too. I mean, he's he did a lot of crazy good stuff too. He had the he had the LaForge maneuver <laughs> into that one TNG episode, right? Where they yeah. have the upper section split with the uh, the um the the lower section. Yeah. Um, there were several things that he did. So, uh, but, but as far as like, I, I, I would say Scotty might be the OG MacGyver in Star mm -hmm. Trek for sure. Mm -hmm. The only engineer that we knew that transported humpback whales. And, not wa a, and water too, and water. by the way, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Captain, <laughs> there be whales down uh, here. I love that line from Scotty. Uh, There'd be whales down here. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So it was it was cool how he described to you know when when we find him. Then well, okay, shortly after that, right? Shortly after that, we discover the other survivors and we are reunited with Captain Battelle, right? I think shortly after that. So that was great. great. Was there an, a big sigh of relief when you saw her, Chris? That she wasn't one of the dead amongst the Cayuga. Yes. I kind of felt like yes. when they took the shuttle down, there's I, I just couldn't see them doing all of that work and then them showing up and Battelle's dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I kind of had a feeling she was going to be alive down there. Yeah. I agree. She is a uh, yeah, she's becoming one of the my favorite characters on the show. I noticed, yeah. Yeah, she's good. I I, I yeah. really enjoy her. I think she adds a great dynamic. I think she's got a wonderful interplay and relationship with her and Pike. She bout we talked about this in the last episode, right? She balances him. I think yeah very well as the Boy Scout versus this kind of woman who would like to be a little bit more adventurous. Um, but Pike Pike doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's super adventurous. He seems you know he's kind of mentioned before. He just wants to go out into a cabin in the woods and fish and hang out and you know very very um. You know, I think uh, kind of stoic in that regard. Yeah, he is stoic. Yeah. Stoic Boy Scout. Yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> but yeah. back on the Enterprise, mm -hmm. we get this idea um, after Uhura and Pelia find the location of what the Gorn are using to jam, you know, the ability to communicate and transport. The crew comes up with this, I pl this plan to use the saucer section of the Cayuga to destroy this Gorn device, this Gorn dampening field on the planet. Uh, and unfortunately it requires somebody to go into a spacewalk and plant special, these special rockets or thrusters or whatever they were on the saucer section yep. uh, in, in specific places. And I noticed Spock was very adamant about going out there and doing it he said he had to be the one and and i you know i think we kind of know why because he's worried about chapel right yeah um he, he doesn't know if chapel was down on the surface or she was back up on the on the um on the ship they do mention i was it uhura in in pelia that mentioned that or, or maybe it was when they were when they were looking at the saucer section trying to look for survivors um that they noticed that the whole med, med medical Med Bay, or whatever, is completely blown away. It's gone. Yeah, the sick bay was gone. Yeah, yeah sick bay was gone. Yeah, there was a a nice scene before that with with Una and Spock, and and Spock expressing to Una, yeah, I mean, this is uncharacter. I don't want to say uncharacteristic of of Spock, but but this was very out there for Spock to kind of express to Una and said, "Hey, I, we didn't end well. I, Chapel and I didn't end well." Um, I feel really bad and you know, I'm really hoping there's a chance, essentially a chance that 
that she survives and um you know una's saying hey it's not this is not your fault so nice scene nice scene right there to, between the two of them and then when they do do that you know una says hey zoom in on the saucer section and they zoom in and sick is not there and you see that expression on spock's face which is pretty sad you're you're yeah. totally right when spock was extremely adamant about him saying i have to be the one to put those rockets on it because he goes he i think he even goes as far as i'm the only one that can do it yeah Something yeah like he that, is right? yeah he mentions yeah. that and i mean uh thank goodness he does because of what happens right but um yeah i think there's there's obviously the attachment to to nurse chapel right that's that's pretty evident um and then i also think it's it's part of that hey because i'm vulcan i'm i have these superior things and so uh i'm i'm the right one for the job i th i think he's right i do think he's the right one for the job but i also think it's his opportunity to go out there and kind of do something maybe take his mind off of the situation a little bit because of you know the uncertainty of chapel status so yeah. i think it's kind of twofold But that it does set up some like when we get there, when we see it a little bit later, it set up some really cool set pieces and scenes. You know that I yeah. I don't think we've ever seen something quite like that, quite like that. But um, really great those visuals too. Um, back planet side, you know we have uh, we you know S Scotty's explaining to Captains Pike and Cap Captain Vettel how he managed to evade the Gord. Gorn, he's telling him about the uh, the sun and the what the corona mass ejections. I I thought yeah. his ability to yep. get through those, yeah, and the CME CMEs, yeah, yep. Um, so in his device, I forget what device he had, but he had connected he some jury sort of... rig something. Yeah, he jury rigged something on the shuttle to make. I think it was to make himself appear like a Gorn ship yeah. or something yeah. like that. Oh, that's right. That's right. Gotcha. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a wizard of an engineer. That's yeah. for sure. Even yeah. even this this early in life, he obviously had a had a, had a uh, you know a skill set meant for engineering. Yeah, very creative. Yeah, and so sorry. I'll go back to the Cayuga because I know that like as we're talking about the Cayuga. Very important on the Cayuga that we realize that Nurse Chapel survived. Um, and is yeah, there. that that scene when the camera likes going to the ship and it's saying something the effect of like critical oxygen alert or whatever. And then, you know, you see, unfortunately, you see, I think, a couple of dead red shirts. Yeah. Always with uh, uh, with debris and stuff covering their bodies or part of their bodies. They're on the floor and, you know, most likely dead. And then we see Chapel and she comes to life and then is able to get into one room and do something to restore, give her like an hour of oxygen, right? Give buys her some time as she's trying to figure out how to get the attention of the enterprise. Yeah. Once she sees it out the window, she's like, I gotta get the attention. And then that, oh gosh, Chris, it's kind of heartbreaking. That scene where Spock's in space and he's flying past the window and she's like, Spock, Spock. Yeah. And um, interesting idea too that she takes out she takes out the the uh flashlight and is trying to make like flashlight strobes, which in all honesty, unless they're specifically zoomed in on that window, the chances of the enterprise seeing that are so slim and they're a good chunk of distance away. Yeah. I so it's a great idea in theory. It just your chances of getting seen with that are really bad. Yeah, I agree. I and I almost thought they were going to use that because earlier in that episode, when Una said, remember your training and they're trying to figure out how are we going to find survivors? Someone says like, um, site, site to site, like communication or direct line of sight communication, like look, look for light, look for smoke, look for fires. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I almost thought, you know, that was going to be something that they incorporated in. Um, and they kind of did a little bit with that flashlight, but yeah. I'm just thinking from a from a physical perspective, hmm. be really I mean, you'd have to just see it just right to, yeah. to catch that. I mean, you know, they have the ability to zoom in the, on their with their main viewer, but still. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you're right. That just totally heartbreaking that he goes goes back and 
Spock goes past. Of course, yeah. Spock's going to pass that exact window and she's going to mm-hmm. see it. And like, hey, Spock. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and honestly, like, it's not like he's going to hear her. I mean, it's yeah. there. She's in space that she's got windows that you're never going to hear any noise out of. Um, and he's not going to hear her with the helmet on and in the vacuum of space. So, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Very interesting. Um, but, it so so back on the planet, Patel and and Pike do decide to use this 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 fake Gorn transponder to, to get to move people secretly. But in order to do it, they have to go out to his old shuttle. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, I believe the shuttle that crashed at the beginning of the episode was his shuttle, right? That would have been the one that crashed because he crashed on, landed oh. on the planet in a shuttle, running from the Gorn. Okay. So I think that's his shuttle. Um, but unfortunately, when they go to the shuttle, there's a baby Gorn in there. And it's a really, really crazy that the Gorn, like, so that moment in the trailer where the Gorn's face to face with somebody, it's Patel. Yeah. And face to face with her and Pike's going to move like he's going to try to grab something yeah. and the thing and the the thing screams at him and gets closer and he's like okay okay like this th- this th- they're not communicating verbally that's like non-verbal communication here that the 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 gorn saying basically don't don't you dare i'm gonna i'm gonna kill her and then he stops and then the gorn takes off and we learn unfortunately that the reason why the gorn didn't harm her is because she's been implanted yeah she sh- like his arm and as soon as she showed him his arm i was like no 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 <laughs> no 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 so yeah. i i want to know chris what were you thinking when you saw that moment because i know that Battelle's is becoming a a, a a favorite character of yours where yeah. did you were you having similar feelings that that i had and i'm sure you did and many others had when we found out hammer had been um you know, in fact, I don't say infected, but um, I don't say I'm pregnant either. But when we, we found <laughs> out that, that Hemmer had 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 yeah. Gorn eggs laid in him. This is what happened. Gorn me. babies. Yeah. yeah I want to hear. Yeah, this is what happened to me. So it was immediately, immediately after the face to face moment that Patel had with the Gorn, the baby Gorn. Yeah. Baby Gorn goes away. I paused it and I stood up and I exclaimed. Alien 3 Resurrection Ripley, and I was upset. And I had to step away. I had to go compose myself for a while. Because <laughs> I paused it for a while. I was like, I couldn't. I was like, I, I was like, this is what and she hadn't revealed her arm yet. I was, but I was I was always thinking, they're doing this. They're doing this to Patel. How dare they do this to Patel? And um it took me a while of like walking back and forth a little bit to kind of compose myself and think, okay, how are they going to, you know, how are they going to save her? What's, what's going to happen? Cause I just was in my mind playing out these possible scenarios where, where if something happens to her, like how terrible, right. That would be for, for, for Pike and just, I think the it would devastate the him. Yeah, it would devastate him. I think it would really affect him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I was like hoping, oh, please don't go there. Please don't go there. Because that's just gonna that's gonna tear him apart. Right. So and they, they went there, at least at least part way there. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. I I I'll be honest with you, Chris. I when that when she revealed her arm, yeah, Pike sees it, the the thought in my mind was like one of those old school video scenes where there there's this one image and I'm, you've probably seen it I'm sure everybody's seen it of this guy in his office in his little cubicle in front of his computer and it stops working and he starts smacking the monitor then he hits the keyboard and takes the keyboard and starts smacking the computer monitor with it and then just goes crazy I my image of you <laughs> even though I know this is not how you are yeah. but my image of you was like you sit on the couch and seeing that and going, no, and like screaming at your TV and then like chucking the remote <laughs> at the TV and getting up and walking out and yeah. being like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. 
Yeah. So I was okay. So I got part of it right. You didn't you, get up and walk out. So. Yeah, you did. So uh, it, when I saw it, it was a little bit late at night. Um, so yeah. because I I paused it and I wanted to text you right there, but I was like, okay, I don't, I, it was going to be late, and I didn't want to want to do that. But I was really, really like, ah, uh, you were angry, weren't you? Yeah, you were angry. Like what am I, I was angry too. I saw. It, I'm like, I'm like for real. Come on. I mean, obviously they can't, they, they can't infect Scotty, but the way the episode ended, maybe there is hope. Yeah. They left it open. It doesn't mean that she's going to die. I mean, we, we, now we have to sit obviously and wait and wonder and hang off a cliff here waiting. We could be waiting a long time, depending on how the strike affects production of, of strange new world season three, which I would have would assume would be starting at some point in the near future. If there was no strike going on. Um, at least to keep it on the same timeline as far as, you know, next year releasing season three, even if it wasn't the same timeline, still having to wait until next May or June. I mean, oh gosh. Yeah. Um, and I know that's, that pales in comparison to what the actors and writers are fighting for. I get that, but, um, yeah. So, so I, I was very mm -hmm. curious when I saw that, that scene in that shuttle, I was like, Oh, Chris is, Chris is not going to be a happy camper. I wasn't either. I was not a happy camper. It's not Cause just, I mean, like when they, when I was finally able to unpause it and they and Pike and Patel were continuing their conversation, you know, Pike, um, you know, Patel was saying, Hey, this, this happened a couple of days ago. Um, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the one to pilot the shuttle and, and destroy the dampening field device. And I almost thought, Oh my God, yes, that's probably what they're going to do in the episode. Cause, cause I'm so happy that, you know, that didn't happen, but all of that was like right. running through my mind. Um, and so I was just thankful that Pike said, hey, there's always hope there's always a chance, you know, being kind of the quintessential Pike that he is. Um, so I feel there's hope. I do feel this hope because why take us through all, all of that, get her into stasis, get her into um, sedation. Uh, I just feel like we've come that far. Yeah, there's there's got to be some hope to, to save her. Uh, yeah, I would hope that from from their previous dealings, you know, they, they spent this time studying enough of the Gorn information and data to come up with new weapons and, and tech to be able to, to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. detect them um, that maybe medically they'd be also studied. I mean, it's, it's Starfleet, it's the Federation. They're always studying and finding new ways of doing things or getting around things or fixing things or solving things. So I have, I, I have hope. I really do. I think for uh, a character like Patel, I definitely have hope. Yeah. Um, that hopefully something will happen. Um, you know, I, I know they killed off Hemmer, but I'm I'm hoping that, you know, she was in, she's was all the way back to the pilot episode. She's still in now. I, I'm kind of just, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll see what happens, but interesting. So we jump, let's jump back to the Cayuga because yeah. the scene here where Chapel is trying to get out of the ship and she comes across before she puts on, I mean, she has her EV suit on, but except for the helmet, she comes across a, a Gorn. Uh, um, I believe uh, it was an adult Gorn at this point. Yeah. First time we're seeing an adult Gorn and it's like rummaging through something and she's trying to get out of there without being seen. And how does she get out of there without being seen? I, I saw her look and see like a, I want to say Jeffrey's tube, but uh, same tube that Una and yeah. Captain Kirk were in, or not Captain, but Lieutenant Kirk. Yeah, because it cut from it cut from that scene. I don't think we ever saw like how she got out of that. No, got around him, right? Okay, yep. yeah, yeah, we didn't see it. But I maybe we can assume that she went through that Jeffrey's tube, if it led anywhere. Maybe possibly. Yeah, yeah it's, po it's possible. I mean, it, I believe when she comes onto the bridge, I think she comes out of one of the turbo lifts, right? I want to say. Yeah. Um, that's how she comes out. So may maybe it was it led to something and then got her onto a turbo lift, but then the turbo lift wouldn't be operated. So maybe 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 that tube led into the turbo lift tube and then she you know flew up or what? Who knows? Because we the, don't really know. The tube looked looked frosted over, like it was cold. Yeah. And then, yeah, like it had been exposed to the vacuum of space. Yeah. Yeah. And so the Gordon wouldn't be able to follow her in it. I would think correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, 
she gets to the bridge and Spock's there. <laughs> but we've got a problem on the bridge because Spock has got an adult Gorn behind him and then a fight ensues. So we get a Gorn fight, kind of similar to your photo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Minus the rubber suit and being on a planet versus in space. Um. <laughs> oh, I, I should tell you this. When me and my friend Ray were coming back from the uh, convention, we drove, on, we're on the highway, and we drove, and out to my right, I saw the spot where they filmed that scene in Arena. Oh, my very, goodness. Very famous spot now. It's got yeah. a, a, yeah, it was very quick. We went by it fairly quickly, but um, yeah. I was, I was like, I'm 99% sure that's the rock outcropping. And then I saw like the little, almost like a little dirt turnabout in there where people can come and park, and I'm pretty sure that's where it was. We drove right by it. Oh, that's so, so cool. Ironic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, cu curious in your thoughts on this scene, Chris, on the fight between the Gorn and Spock and, and uh, Chapel. Yeah. I liked it. I mean, it was a, like a zero G fight scene. You got to see the, uh, I mean, the Gorn was essentially um, killing Spock, right? Had, had his tail wrapped around Spock's neck. Yeah, and it's um, it's big claws on it on his um, helmet. I was waiting to yeah. see like them start cracking Spock's EV helmet. I don't think he they had ended up happening, but I'm kind of surprised there wasn't crack marks and stuff left in it. Yeah, yeah, me too. Um, and then Nurse Chapel comes in, right? And I think she has a phaser and is it about to use it, and I think it gets knocked away. But then we've yeah. got the the two on one fight Gorn against both of them and it was it was really cool um yeah very well choreographed i thought mm -hmm. very well choreographed because after um she is able to get the phaser and i think the phaser is like knocked out and it's almost going out of the out of the bridge and she's able to get it but she's like her boot is stuck on part uh, on something there and i she has to reach out to grab it but she's able to get it turn around and and then fire at the Gorn. And that that was cool. And it was really cool because Spock picks up he picks up some sort of uh debris and smashes it into the Gorn's uh helmet. And it, you yeah, see he it like breaks crack. something off, right? Off like yeah. off a railing or something to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you see it crack and the Gorn struggling and screaming and then writhing and twisting around, and then all of a sudden, you know stopping really cool scene with the Gorn. yeah uh, it was kind of like a zero g fight scene from arena a little bit you know yeah. i mean minus kirk making some you know smoke and rock weapon out of sticks and things <laughs> like that to fight the Gorn. but it was it had that kind of feel to it um just like that that's that captured moment scene in your in your signed photo yeah i liked it yeah, yeah, I I did too. I thought it was good, and it gives us more insight into adult Gorns, mm -hmm. right? And this this kind of this building of the canon, this building of the information behind the Gorn, and kind of what we maybe will see more of in the future. Because the Gorn aren't going away; they're going to be a continued presence as long as they keep making strange new worlds. They're going to be a recurring villain. So will the Klingons? I think the Klingons and the Gorn are going to be probably the two most recurring villains within the series. Um, which would make sense. Uh, I know we only got the Gorn once, I believe, in in Toss, at least on screen. Um, yeah. But but they have made it a point for the Gorn to be a really really menacing villain in Strange New Worlds, and I like it. It does. It brings that that, that horror, that alien type uh, crossover um, presence to to Star Trek, and I think it I think it's fantastic. It's we've had. Some of the best action sequences we've had in the first two seasons have been fighting the Gorn. Yeah. Yeah, it's been amazing. I mean, that fight between Chapel, Spock, and the Gorn on the bridge is... I mean, I, I said it before that this could be a movie, but that this was a very cinematic and theatrical, I feel like, visual fight scene that they, they brought up. And personal at the same time right it is yeah. very personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, fight there but just um, amazing what they did so they did a great job 
Yeah, it was really good. And I, I think it's important that we mention, you know, when Scotty talks about these coronal mass ejections or CMEs, which are a real thing, by the way, our son does that, mm-hmm. um, which what can cause electromagnetic interference and things like that from massive solar flares and these coronal mass ejections and so forth. Um, it's interesting because, you know, Pike brings up the idea that the Gorn behavior might be more organized than than just a bunch of these crazy psycho creatures running around killing things, right? There's there's more to it, and that potentially solar activity has something to do with how they communicate or how they react and respond. Um, and I think that's interesting to note because that may come into play down the road if we see the Gorn again, which I think we're going to at some point, um, whether we see them in the first episode of season three or we see them at some point again. Um, But yeah, unfortunately that kind of, you know, that whole idea led to us finding out about Patel and her, you know, being implanted with the Gorn babies. Um, But we do get, so, so Spock is successful right in in getting the rockets planted uh the the thrusters planted whatever they're called and then they are able to maneuver the cayuga's saucer section really cool scene yeah and it comes crashing down and completely obliterates the uh the dampening field set up by the gorn and i i found it interesting so when they when they first got into that barber shop lawn and and um pike are sitting there right in that mm-hmm. in that barber shop and there's other people around too and lon makes a point and so this is this whole like cultural world building of the gorn is happening and taking place here in this episode because of this moment and we're going back a little bit lon mentions that that something about that's kind of what they do they set down this thing on the planet it dampens stuff and now you're not able to rescue people and they can just kind of it's like open open season hunting now Yes. Um, and so you kind of start to see how the Gorn are doing things, how they're organized, how they're maneuvering, how what types of things affect them. Um to a certain extent, communication. I mean, it's really all building up this 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 species that we have known since the very beginning of Star Trek. Yes. Yes. It's so much that they can explore with these species. And in, in a little bit I thought about the species too, is it seems like when they run out of food. And we saw some of the baby Gorns uh, either, I don't know if they, they were eating or attacking another like fallen or dead Gorn. Yeah, the one oh, they shot, they started eating they it. Shot? And then yeah. they, got, they got spooked and ran off. But yeah, maybe they're cannibalistic when they get to a certain certain amount of hunger. Yeah. Um. So yeah, so they, they are able to, once the once the, the dampening field is, is destroyed, they're able to get sensors and comms and transporters and everything back up. They're able to get everybody beamed back up as quickly as possible. They rush Captain Battelle off to sick bay. Mm-hmm. Um, Pike and Scotty uh, walk off and, and we get a nice little funny reunion between Pelia and uh, and Scotty. And I love this exchange where, where Pelia says, hello, Scotty. And yeah. he's like, professor. And then Pike says, you know each other? And Pelio was like, one of my best students who sadly received some of my worst grades. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. thought that was a great little exchange. It was. And the look on Scotty's face, uh, you know, was was priceless. He just he looked like a you know, just a little boy, like thinking, Oh, I it, you know, I've let my teacher down, something like that. Um, and Pike's just like, All right, I'm gonna leave you guys to it. He like walks off. That was great. But between Una and Scotty, do you get the feeling that Pelia was a pretty tough professor? Like she didn't exactly hand out, you know, good grades very easily. You really, really had to work for it. Uh, maybe more so than in other classes. She seemed like a very, maybe probably fair to a certain extent, but very tough professor. And because she's been around so long, she's obviously had multi generations of Federation officers who she's taught at the academy. Yeah, I do get that feeling. You know, the good type of professor that will try and bring out the complete potential of an individual. Yeah. So yeah, that was good. Oh, and and she, like the uh, what Pelia says, looking at Scotty. Scotty's got this armful of kind of looks like 
equipment and junk in his yeah in his hands and she's like the hell is this that you have yeah. <laughs> you know? What are we supposed to do with this? You know? Yeah, that was fa- yeah, that was good. This is what I mean. Like, I think the, the more Pelia we get, the more I really, really am enjoying her character. Right? She's she's witty, uh, she's very smart, very good engineer. Um, was obviously a really tough professor. Like, we're just getting a lot of stuff that I, I'm really enjoying about her. So I, I hope we continue to get more from her, um, which would be awesome. Now, here's as as the inter- as the episode winds down and comes to a close. The so the Gorn ships are closing in on the Enterprise. Once the the they have destroyed this this dampening field, the Gorn go nuts, right? They realize that some that you know the ship has done something. They turn around and start attacking the Enterprise, right? All these little Gorn ships. Then this like Gorn warship shows up, and it's go everything's going crazy. The ship's being attacked all over, and they're asking Captain, "What do we do?" And Captain, "What should we do?" We need to get out of here and we retreat. All you know, and Pike freezes. He just freezes. He knows there's more crew down on the surface. Then he gets word that the landing party, which included Dr. Mbenga, Lon, Ted Ortegas, and Sam Kirk, got beamed off the planet and onto the Gorn ships when the dampening field went down. So now it's like, okay, do I take, you know, do I cut and run basically and save, you know, not risk the rest of the lives on board the enterprise and leave my crew there. Or do I go after them and fight for them? So, and then, and then it ends and then we get it to be continued. So this is the first cliffhanger for strange new worlds. First two parter, as we talked about, yeah. um, uh, maybe they're going to consider it a two parter. Maybe they won't, maybe it won't be like hegemony part two. Maybe it'll be another named episode, but it'll be a continuation. So technically yeah. a two parter um, for the first time in strange new worlds, but this was really a serious scene because he's he's frozen, and hey. we so we, we know we're going to get more Gorn because we know that the, the, that those crew members are on board the Gorn ships. We know that's got to be a re- thing that has to get have to get resolved early on in season three. Yeah, yeah, and just like a little bit earlier in that moment, I think it was Uhura that said, "Hey, Captain, we we just got a secure message from Starfleet from Admiral April," and and he says, "What is it?" And she says. Oh, Admiral April is re- ordering you to retreat. And right, so he's, and then every, so the whole whole bridge has heard that hey, we're being ordered to retreat. Um, yeah, he know he knows his people are on the Gorn ship, and not just his people, but the people from the Cayuga too. And so you that expression on his face, right? Because I think, I I I feel like he knows what he's gonna do. Um, because his choices are okay. He's either try and save the people, and which will put the enterprise at great risk, and then start a war, because that's what it would do. That's the big thing. Yeah. It's 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 not so much that the Federation doesn't want their crew the crew back, right? Yeah. It's they they don't want to risk war with the Gorn because we've obviously seen how vicious the Gorn are. We've seen how you know tough fighters they are we've seen the the power of their ships and their technology the federation doesn't want to get involved in that especially after having just made peace with the klingons at least for now we know that that's not going to stay forever right but it's a big deal the federation does not want a big bloody war on their hands after having just come out of the klingon war not that long ago yeah 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 we'll see what happens such a hard um scenario for pike right there I mean, yeah, in the and, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, and and he freezes. That's the big thing. He freezes. He he's a cool, calm, collected guy, right? He has no issues being able to make decisions under pressure, and he freezes in this moment, a very big moment where he's like, "Uh, do I go get my crew? Do I uh, you know, do do we run? Like he he doesn't he he doesn't know. He freezes and then boom, scene end, episode over. Yeah. That's a huge turning point in Pike's captaincy. I know it's not a word, but that's a big turning point. We have not seen him have this reaction at any point so far in his command. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll have to wait for the next episode to see what it does. I mean, he might, you know, it might be, it, episode might start, start off with, he turns around and gives orders, you know, unfreezes right at that moment and 
is given could orders be. to the crew, you know. It could be, yeah. But for, for all we know, he froze. Yeah. And uh I I found myself in the episode end going, What? <laughs> they can't do this to us. Well, you you have so much to resolve. Give give us a like an hour and a half, you know, give us a two hour long season finale or something, you know. You yeah. So it, it does not end with a happy bow on it. We've got we've got Battelle in sick bay with with Gorn babies growing in her. We've got, you know, a chunk of the landing party gone on the Gorn ship. We've got Pike freezing. Uh and most importantly, Lawn is on that ship. And I will tell you right now, if they do anything to Lawn, I'm gonna be on the picket line. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm gonna be out in front of Paramount and you'll be out there with me. I will. If they do anything to Patel, right? Yeah, that's right. Or 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 Chapel, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I I'm yeah. I'm left I'm left wanting more a lot more. Um. And but but overall, I thought it I thought it was a great episode. There were some amazing moments, some amazing scenes and sets, like you mentioned. Uh, get get so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Besides just this episode, let, let's go back. Let's take a look at the season as a whole, season two as a whole. Give me some of just your overall thoughts of the season and maybe some potential highlight points. Yeah. Oh, I mean, overall thoughts, if I could characterize the season, it is one of, um, and I think a lot of people would characterize it this way. Uh, one of um, taking chances of yeah. these, you know, these different kinds of episodes these old scientists and then space rhapsody uh that is one character is characterization i'd have of the season also um the way i would characterize the season is they are finding the different edges and what i mean from that is you have an edge of being very very light and then let's go uh very very serious and they're doing this the sine wave approach of all right, we're going to take you back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and so you're on either edge, but not necessarily like going going mediocre in the center. And, you know, that, that's, uh, that's to the creator's credit to kind of like, hey, let's find the edges of where we can be uh, for the audience. Um, so that's, those are some of my thoughts too. And, um, Highlight episodes, of course, are, uh, of course, are Subspace Rhapsody, which I think would be a highlight for a lot of people. Um, but also the one where I'm trying to remember the I'm trying to remember the episode. Uh, but it is the one where Battelle gives Pike the uh, the gift at the beginning, uh, and then he has you know some things happen and he has to make. He makes up with that's the tail at the end. Yeah, that's among the Lotus Eaters. That's where they go to Ride Gel Seven and forget. Thank you, thank yep. you. Yeah, yeah. It's that episode because <laughs> I forgot I was among. Oh my god, you were among but, the Lotus Eaters. But the feeling was yes. But the feeling was with me on why that episode was important. Yeah, so, yeah. the the, the emotions and the feelings never left you. <laughs> yeah, you had you had your forgetting, didn't you, Chris? I did have my forgetting. So, um, yeah, yeah so. It was those. Um, and I purposely left out the ones with Kirk because I was like, okay, um, this is cool that cool, but you know, that's the highlights for me are highlights for me are either gonna be um that involve uh Battelle or Nurse Chapel or yeah. uh and Pike. So yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, that's kind of my some of my floating overall thoughts on season two. Yeah. Yeah. And you. All right. So overall thoughts, yeah. uh, season two, definitely. I, I absolutely agree with everything you said. Um, season two, they, they took risks. Uh, I, I would characterize season two as up and down, right? Yeah. You got really heavy episodes, really light episodes. I found myself enjoying subspace Rhapsody and those old scientists more than I thought I would. Mm. When I found out about those couple episodes and what they were doing, I was just like, "Ooh, this is this is not like tra like really traditional Star Trek. This is like it's kind of out there a little bit, you know, for compared to like Legacy Trek, right? The '90s stuff. Um, well, I guess Legacy Trek's a better term because that because Toss wasn't '90s, 
Enterprise wasn't 90s. So I guess that legacy checks better. It tossed through Enterprise, right? It, yeah. You, you really didn't see that, um, these kind of episodes. Uh, I found myself in in the episodes like Among the Lotus Eaters and Under the Cloak of War really heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, especially under the cloak of war, super dark, super gritty, dealing with very, very difficult emotional things and trauma, PTSD. Um, not because I enjoy those things, but the under the cloak of war might be my favorite episode of the season. Mm. Ah. Um, if it, it, I have to maybe think through it some more, but just kind of off the top of my head. Yeah. That might yeah. be my favorite episode because you you saw some really significant emotions. You saw some really significant trauma and backstory behind two characters that didn't have much of anything from Toss, and that's Chapel and Mbenga. Yeah. Um, the more Dr. Mbenga I get, the more I want to know, the more I like him, uh, the more I, I empathize for him and feel for him with the stuff he's been through with his daughter. I mean, think about it. He lost his daughter to some weird nebula alien cloud yeah. thing which we know we talked about that in our season one yeah. we didn't like that right we didn't like the way they did that that wasn't a that wasn't an ending we enjoyed at all um but he gave up his daughter for this because of her disease and they cured her and then sent her off into this cloud nebula uh, that i didn't like that at all and then so we get that he has that trauma he also has the past trauma of the klingon war and the things he did and this being this fighter and brutality and I mean, uh, he's a really complex character mm-hmm. who's been through a lot. So I, I really am liking him. Uh, the guy who plays him, Babs, and I I, I don't want to say his last name because I'll butcher it. He's a fantastic actor. He's been in a lot of other stuff too, but uh, really good job with him, Benga. Um, so I, I, Under the Cloak of War and, and um, uh, Among the Lotus Eaters are the two, as far as heavy episodes go, the two that stand out the most to me. Um, I, I think we got way too much Kirk. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 lo- I did like the relationship and interplay between him and his brother, Sam, as well as him meeting Spock and, and, and Uhura and kind of getting to know some of those characters. I will say my favorite part of season two might, well, not might be, I think it is. We got a lot of lawn. Yeah. So I'm, I'm happy about oh. that. You remember if, if you guys watched our season one, we did just the whole season review and, and thoughts. I did mention that I hope we got more lawn in season two and I, I wanted more and we did. So I got, I got one of my wishes. We got more lawn and more lawn and more and more and more, which is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's some kind of some highlights for me uh, in general. This last episode I also thought was really good. Uh, definitely there's some unresolved relationships and issues that I think we have to look into going into season three. Right. I mean, yeah. they, they, Kind of result they well they kind of they did they resolved the Kirk and Lawn kind of crush thing that she had going on, um, which I thought was good in the sense that Kirk's not really the guy she was going to want to go after. He's not, you know, um, you know what's going to happen with with Chapel and the Fellowship and her relationship with Spock. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pike and Patel obviously. Is so I'm thinking about that. Uh, you know. I don't know what what are some other like maybe unresolved relationships or issues that you could think of that maybe we need to be keeping an eye out for for season three. I have a theory. I I don't think you're gonna like it. I'm sorry. I know you're not. And you know what though, I, you had this uh, theory just the other day before we watched this episode about Battelle, so you could yeah. be right. What are your spidey senses telling you this time? Okay, I hope I'm. I think maybe I'm wrong. We'll we'll see because this would be too soon, right? But. Right now, at the moment, Le- Leon and Sam Kirk are both um, on the Gorn ship, right? That's what they are. They they went down, of course, they went down together on the shuttle. They report part of the strike team. Um, I, there, was like, there was this moment in this episode where I saw Kirk, Sam Kirk look at Leon and maybe her look at, at Sam where I thought, huh. I wonder if they're going to try and develop something between Sam and Leon. Because in this reality, 
right? It's James Kirk is he's he's gone, or yeah, he's Kirk. You know, Kirk. He's he's Kirk. Yeah. Kirk. Um, we're getting a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more of Sam, learning about him, and he's he's a pretty neat guy and like really really really, really smart. So I thought, oh, I wonder if they'll play around with that a little bit. Kind of think it'd be too soon. Uh, but we'll we'll see. Um so that is when I was thinking about relationships, you know, that is like uh one of the things that came to my mind. I think they'll still keep um trying to explore the relationship, assuming Patel Captain Patel survives, which I, I hope she does, having to to continue that relationship with Captain Pike and Captain Patel. Um Spock and Nurse Chapel, I think will uh after her fellowship if they're assuming they're both on the enterprise it'll i don't think they'll be as close i think they'll just they just um will you think they'll like drift apart yeah i think they'll kind of avoid each other you know they'll mm -hmm. still i don't know though spock spock was real adamant about this wanting another chance or hoping that he still gets another opportunity you know yeah. so i, I don't Maybe she drifts, but I don't know that he because remember he kind of he put a pause on his on his uh his Engage engagement, yeah, or maybe you know, slash ending the relationship, uh, in part because of her. So or to Pring did, right? To Pring put the uh, I think it was kind of mutual. Yeah, mutual, yeah. Um yeah, so we'll see what, what happens there. I, I will okay. One of the things I was thinking about this episode at the end was uh, you had like it four different Gorn ships come in right? or yeah. several, several Gorn ships come into that demarcation line and you only had the enterprise there. And I was thinking, why weren't there more Federation ships coming in to at least, you know, just be there or be back up yeah. or, or, and I was like, why not? You know, what were they just too far away? Um, I think it could be that, yeah. And then I think it could also be just the, the Federation doesn't want to present itself at, at uh, a uh, or or make the Gorn view it as though they're stacking ships and then they want to go to war because there's nothing there wouldn't be anything to stop something from happening and and maybe part of it is they just didn't want to risk any more ships going into the area and getting destroyed. Uh, maybe I think it could be a several like of those things, right? I mean the the idea of confronting the Gorn with a bunch of ships might appear as though they're trying to be hostile. And you're escalating right? too and, far, yeah. Yeah, and because because they don't know how to communicate with the Gorn yet, they they have to be very careful and kind of tread softly. Yeah. Um. So another theory I have, and uh, I I don't think I don't think this is going to happen, but we'll see. But but so the Enterprise was the, was the only ship at the moment, right? Now, a theory that I have that could happen was maybe the. The Farragut comes with, with Kirk, James Kirk as the mm. first officer, and then comes to support the fair. Uh, comes so the Farragut comes to support the Enterprise. Now, um, I, which is okay, which is fine. You would there'd be more Kirk. Um, you you'd have more Kirk in a heroic situation helping out the circumstance. But if that happens, what I feel that. Uh, potentially, what I feel like what could be potentially bad is that now maybe you're taking away something from Pike. Yes, right? you know. Yeah, because I feel like we've already had situations, and this goes back to Discovery, where it feels like Kirk shows up to save the day for Pike because Pike can't handle things, mm -hmm. and I feel like that sets a bad precedent. Like, okay, Pike's not good enough of a captain to handle things, so we need Kirk to save the day. I I don't like that because that that kind of feels like you're you're schwacking Pike off at the knees, mm -hmm. right? Like oh oh we have this leading captain of the series, but he's not good enough to handle things, so we need a the we need a, a known quantity in Kirk, Captain Kirk or this time at this time period, uh you know the first officer James T Kirk to come in and save the day. Well, he's the first officer. Why should the first officer be coming in to save the day every time a captain's in distress somewhere? It's some other captain on another ship. To me, that just seems bizarre. 
Mm -hmm. So I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that doesn't go that way. It takes credibility away from Pike, too, I feel like, as a captain. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I need this lieutenant to come save me all the time because I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Yeah. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully it doesn't happen. And Pike, I just have a feeling I've just got to see Pike. He needed that moment to compose himself because he's got to make these two, he's got to make a decision and they're kind of on, on the extreme. I mean, so yeah. We'll see okay. Happens. So yeah. do you have any expectations for season three? Anything that you're, you know, maybe hoping slash expecting to see, we did this at the end of season one, right? For season two, I, I got one of my hopes and expectations, mm-hmm. which was more law on. Is there anything that you can think of knowing what we know now, the first two seasons, going into season three at some point whenever we get it i want to know more about um ortegas's backstory i think that would be cool a yeah. little bit more about i think she's a great great kind of cool character there so that'd be most excellent um hoping that they continue to have captain Battelle um throughout now now that the cayuga has gone she's gonna have to get a new starship so i wonder what starship that would be hmm. um yeah more gorn I figure there's got to be a lot more gorn 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 the other other white meat yeah yeah gorn the other white meat that'd be good um so that that'd be cool i want more of that uh you know what we haven't had um we've had Sp- spock and Amanda, that's right, because I really like this. This is my favorite version of Amanda, Spock's mother. Hmm. Uh, we've heard him talk about his father, allude to his father, but haven't had his father. Has We have not had his father in Strange New Worlds yet. I think he was in Discovery, but not in Strange New Worlds. Uh, I'm trying to remember on Discovery. Yes, yes, he was. Yeah, yeah, played by an actor named James Frain, who was in Gotham and has been a bunch of James Fran, been a bunch of other stuff. He played Spock's father. Okay. Really good actor. Okay. That'd be, that'd so be I'm good. assuming if we get him, we would be the same actor, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see same that. time period, right? As as when we when we get him in Discovery at that mm-hmm. point before, you know, Discovery goes off into the future. But mm-hmm. and I want um I want completely new aliens that they they meet and just uh, uh, where they've got to meet some new civilizations and get that stuff figured out. So, yeah, those are some some of my expectations. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if if the audience is still with I misspoke earlier. Sorry, this is a random thought. I I said Lagrange transform. It's Laplace transform. So I was totally off on that. Well, she does say in the episode Lagrange point. Lagrange Point, yes, she yeah. does. Yeah. yeah, she does say that. Yes. Yep. Um, so I was off. Yeah, my bad. Well, it's okay. <laughs> I, I've been off many a time, so it's all good. <laughs> join, join the club, Chris. Um, um, your your expectations? Did that spur any? Yeah, I'm really curious. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So expectations for me. Um, Patel doesn't die. Hopefully. Yeah. She better. Hopefully that, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um. Yeah, more Gorn. I think they're they're super villainous looking, very alien like. I I I love the idea of this recurring villain. They have to deal with this period of time, right? They're having the these these battles. Uh, I don't know if this episode's leading them down the road of potentially having a war with the Gorn mm-hmm. versus just some skirmishes and some standoffs like we've seen so far. Uh, but that would be cool to see. Um, I I, I want. Lawn, lawn, and some more lawn, like I, I asked for last time. So I'll rub the genie bottle and maybe <laughs> maybe I'll get my wish again. Um, I'd love to see some more Hammer flashbacks. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Uh, I'd love to see that, or or see Bruce in in some other roles, maybe in 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 Strange New Worlds. Um, the alien thing, yes, I agree. More new aliens. They they they've had some really cool creative ones. There's some other ones though from Toss that we got but we don't know much about i'd love to see the tholians again remember you have the famous episode the tholian web that would be cool to see them bring the tholians into this show and have some type of 
you know, confrontation or some type of interaction or meeting with them will be the Tholians. I would love to see more Andorians and Tellarites because at this period of time, you're you're talking about about a hundred years or so after the founding of the Federation or after Enterprise. Um, the Federation is still fairly new. You're talking right about a hundred years or so, mm-hmm. just right around a hundred years old. Uh, I we have seen glimpses of Tellarites mm-hmm. uh, and Andorians in this show. I'd love to see more of that. You know, yeah. we had the we had the Andorian. During the Klingon War and um, um, under the Cloak of War episode, that 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 Andorian officer was killed. We had the Tellarite admiral in the uh, the trial of Una. Um, so we we have gotten some some of that. I'd like to see some more though. That'd be great. Um, and other expectations are just the, the the continual development of relationships. The one thing. This isn't an expectation. This is a hope. Yes. If if you know, Akiva Goldsmith and um, Alex Kurtzman are watching, please stop with Kirk. All right, we get it. <laughs> we know who Kirk is. All right, it's nothing against Paul Wesley. He's a great actor. But this show, I this this show should be about Pike and his crew. Stop bringing Kirk in every single time that we want to bail something out or we want we need you know. As fans, I don't know how everybody, all the fans are. For me personally, I don't need Kirk in this show to be to watch it and be drawn to it. I'm drawn to the characters you've already created, the character, the brand new character. I mean, my favorite character is a brand new character in Lawn, right? I also want to see more backstory for Ortegas and for some more dive into the con background with with uh, Lawn. Um, but yeah, just just stop with Kirk. I mean, let's let's you know, you want to bring him in once in a blue moon, that's fine. But I just feel like we're getting too much, so. I say that now and then watch one of them, like with Terry Metallis, one of them will be watching our podcast and then I'll stick my boot in my mouth. But I'm I'm going to hold <laughs> to this one, though. I love this show. I've loved it from the very beginning. I just don't want so much Kirk. Yeah, well, it, focus yeah. on the crew as it is now with Pike. Yeah, every every time they bring in, uh, new, so they brought in Scotty, right? Yeah. But every, every time they bring in someone that is of the, toss ensemble it makes me think oh is our are we are we that close to the end of strange new worlds right because i mean we we shouldn't be right we should have still have several years before his accident happens yeah yeah so that that's all there um so i had another random thought sorry uh like i it, this this made me think of the pilot episode pilot episode of toss was the cage right yeah, the first pilot episode, yes. And then they had another, they had, um, I have to go back and look. I, I want to say it was the Man Trap was the first episode that aired mm-hmm. with Kirk as, uh, or with uh, with Kirk in it and for um, uh, Shatner in it as well. Yeah, yeah. I, but, but don't yeah. quote me on that, but I want to say it was the Man Trap. In the, in the cage, I think there's the scene where Spock smiles. Mm-hmm. He's looking at a flower, and you see him smile. Uh, so that's Spock with Captain Pike, Pike, Captain Pike's crew. And so in in Strange New Worlds, we've been having like a few different, um, you know, scenes where Spock is more emotive than we see him in Toss uh, traditionally. Yeah. So it's kind of it made me think about that. Like, oh, okay, that's where where Spock smiles. So maybe they're connecting, making some sort of connection to that. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that's a, that's a fair point. I think, yeah, the, I, I think looking at what's to come mm-hmm. and beginning to make connections to help br- bridge everything together makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's wrap up our review of episode number ten of season two of Strange New Worlds um, with our overall rating for the season. Now we did this for season one. We've done this for other shows we've watched and movies and things like that. Where we give our random red shirt podcast official. <laughs> rating we do it on a scale of one to five com badges so chris i must ask you i don't have anything witty tonight so i'll just try to ask you <laughs> one to five com badges where are you rating season two of strange new worlds it is just at a four um i'll give it to four I'll, it was between the three and a half to a four okay so, um you know just at the very tip of that four um so there were there was an episode so i really liked this last episode but um you know the episode tomorrow, 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 mm-hmm. uh, with with Kirk, and 
Uh, yeah, this is that where, episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I try yeah. to black that. I'm trying to black those seeds out, but yes. Yeah, and this is where we were both upset at it, and I still feel like there was, uh, to me, not to me, this is just like, you know, the way that particular Kirk had met his demise, and the way I was just thinking, I, that, remember, remember, I was really reminded of Terminator in that one, and just thinking, oh, okay, this just really feels, feels like this, and then the ending just, it just kind of, ugh, didn't, yeah. didn't feel great on that, so... You know that that one had a, an effect. the The pilot episode actually didn't stay with me that much. I mean, where they um, were on that, I don't even, I can't even remember that group's name. It was like I want to say Crimson Crimson Sun, or it was something like that. It was this name that felt like a Star Wars esque name. The only thing that I, I liked about it was, um. Spock getting to drink all the blood wine and kind of uh, making up there. So um, season one, we had, I had given the five and I thought that just was terrific on so many, so many different levels um, of, of comedy and being uh, original and being serious. You know, the, the trial episode in this season two was also really good, but it, but I feel like, okay, it's felt like almost forced in like, yes, Star Trek has in Star Trek history and Star Trek lore. We have all these great trial episodes. And so this kind of felt like forced, like, since there's been all these great trial episodes, let's make a trial episode for, for mm. season two. Um, and, you know, did it happen organically on like, hey, the, did it happen like, hey, this is a really good topic where there should be a trial? Or did it happen where, oh, we really need an episode where there is a trial? Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there was, you know, I, I think they had to because of what they did with Una being arrested at the end of season one. They had they had to do it. I yeah. think it was I think it was more of just, hey, this this we're going to have this because of what we've put into the story already, not versus just, oh, we're randomly having a trial episode. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I totally get it. Um, I, I would say for me. Um, so you're, you're giving it a four, four, four out of five com yeah. badges. OK. For me, uh, I'm probably going to do about a four and a half. And the half is for some of the things I've, I've mentioned in all the episode reviews I didn't like. I'm going to take a half a uh, comm badge away for that. There were a lot of really great things, though. There were some really, really heavy episodes in this season that really made me think or really, really hit me emotionally or got to me. And, and to me, that's the that's the heart of Star Trek. That's the heart of of why we like it. Star Trek makes you think. It's heady. It requires it requires um, participation on the part of the audience to say, you know, okay, if I'm in this situation, what would I do? How does this affect me? You know, I oh, I've experienced something like this before. You know, maybe you're somebody out there who has experienced PTSD or ex- you know extreme trauma, and you can relate to what Doctor Mbanga and Nurse Chapel went through in the Klingon War. Those types of things, like 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 Star Trek communicates and speaks to many of us in many different ways and so i think they got to the heart of that yes there are things i didn't like i didn't want as much kirk and you know some of the things in some of the different episodes yeah but but i i think i gave season one a five as well i still think overall i like season one better but season two gave us some really memorable moments and they 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 got so creative with the season that i i kind of felt like i had to give them that extra half com badge yeah. because of the creativity the funness of it. And it was quite the ride this season, right? It was a lot of ups and downs, heavy episode, then a light episode, then a heavy episode. And I thought that was good. They went back and forth versus like, oh, we're going to have three heavy episodes in a row where you, every time you leave the episode, you're just like, oh gosh, <laughs> kill me. And then we'll have the fun ones. No, they, 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 they balanced it out. Right. It's just like, yeah. like, like uh, Mr. Miyagi says, you know, balance, not just for karate for whole life. Mm-hmm. right in this case they 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 found good balance 
within the season. So I, uh, for me, I'm going to go four and a half on this four one. Half, uh, right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So anyways, well, that was it. We are done with season two of Star Trek Strange New World. It's been a ride. We've had an absolute blast. This was this was so much fun. This is the second time now we've done an episode by episode review. The first one was Picard season three. If you want to watch that or listen to it, please feel free to go back. Um, but I, I loved going through this episode by episode, Chris. I think this was a great season to do that, especially because of some of the content topics and episodes that we saw in this season of Strange New Worlds. Yeah, it was great to do. Um, we have to like, do some real deep dives too. Yeah, we went very deep. Yeah. It's good though. We enjoy that. It's a lot of fun. And um we hope and we know a lot of our audience enjoys it too. But uh yeah. and thank you, audience, for staying with us as we go on our different tangents and rabbit holes. But that's what make that's what makes the conversation fun. And rants too. Don't forget <laughs> my Kirk rant. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's it's like anything else that you watch or read or listen to, right? These are our opinions, our views, our thoughts. Um, some of you will agree. Some of you will not. And that's cool because we can all have an opinion just like our belly buttons, right? Um, and it's great. And and we love sharing our thoughts. Um, we love doing these deep dives. I, I think for me, Chris, the deep dives are most fun because it really makes me think even more. More yeah. than just, you know, I watch the episode and I think, right? But then when we're putting our notes together and we're, and, and we're watching it and we're reviewing it and everything like that, it it really makes it go through even more and deeper and 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 reviewing that whole thing. So um it's been a blast. Uh I love this series very much. It's been really well done and so many different levels. Yeah, there's always gonna be gripes, moans, and complaints about stuff. But in general, I I really do think outside of Picard season three, this is absolutely the best of the new trek. It really is. Mm. Yeah. I, and I know there's a lot of straight fans of uh lower decks and discovery. But I'm still going to hold to it. I think I think Strange New Worlds is still the best new new Trek we have, um, by a pretty significant margin. I think so. It's been great. Yeah, I I cannot disagree because I well because I haven't seen Lower Decks and and you know I haven't gone far in Discovery after after a while had to stop. Yeah, had to stop. Yeah. I get it. So, all right. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching and listening all over the globe and the interwebs. We really do appreciate it. Again, be sure to head over to Facebook and Instagram. Check us out there. Be sure to follow us, like us, subscribe, whatever the button is uh, on that particular platform. You can also find us on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to follow us or subscribe there as well as on YouTube. You can find us there and find the video version of this episode if you are listening to us. So be sure to go to YouTube, hit the subscribe subscription button and the bell for notifications for all the latest content and episode releases of the Random Retro Podcast. So thank you, everybody. Take care. We'll catch you next time right here on the Random Retro Podcast.